I'm Farwood. Uh, I don't spell out my last name. It's hard for you, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, um, I'm from Iran, so I think I'm the first Iranian to like be in your podcast. And uh, I'm a data engineer slash MLOps engineer, MLOps to be. Like I'm trying to implement MLOps here. Uh, in Yektonet, uh, it's an ad company in Iran, and uh, I like to have a black esp- espresso in the morning to just wake up. <laughs> yeah, it's my main challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm a man of tradition. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patrick Barker. I am the uh, CTO of Guitaros. Uh, we are building a uh, of AI agents uh, and. I don't, I don't really drink coffee. It like makes me crazy, and I like shake really bad when I drink it. I think I'm like allergic to it or something. So I actually just eat a ton of chocolate every morning, just bars of chocolate. I eat like two bars of like dark chocolate a day. So, boom shakalaka, we're back with another MLOps community podcast. I'm your host Demetrios, and today we got into it. It got a little bit of spicy because we had. A nice little thread getting kicked off, and in that thread there were two some there were two very opinionated people. So they were kind enough to agree to come on to this podcast here and talk about their feelings on the certain subject of MLOps and the evolution of MLOps, what the difference between quote unquote LLM ops is if LLM ops is even a thing, or if it's just a buzzword to get money from investors for a tool. We talked about all of it, and I really felt like there were some insightful things that Patrick and Faut both said on each side. I found myself agreeing with both of them, even though they kind of were very different opinions and almost different sides of the spectrum on the opinions. I'll let you judge for yourself what you thought of it. As a little bit of background with Faoud, he is the first dude that we've had on here from Iran, which is incredible in my eyes. We're getting people from all over the world. It just shows you how the community is so global and it is so cool to see what people are working on in each little nook and cranny around the globe. And of course, Patrick, a straight American, he's working with my buddy, Dan Jeffries, a one of like the first people that joined the community back in the day in 2020. And he, if you look up his virtual meetup, he did some really cool stuff on AI generated songs back in 2020 before that was even popping off and it was a thing. So... Patrick's working with him as CTO. Dan Jeffries is CEO of their new startup, Kentaros. Before that, Patrick goes into what he was doing in the MLOps world and then in the DevOps world and how these skills are quite different from where he finds himself today playing with agents. And Faout is a data scientist by trade. He's been doing data engineering and now he is killing it as an MLOps role. And he took the side of, I do not think LLM ops is even worth giving it any time or attention or mind. So let's, let's just listen to this conversation. And I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions by writing them in the comments. As always, the number one thing that I ask from you is to share this with a friend so that they can bask in the joy of listening to all of us. Let's get into it. Check out this bullshit I just got. What? (laughs) For those who can't see me right now, I just turned my whole room into a disco that is... uh, It looks like a dark room from movies. Have you all heard of red light therapy? Oh, yeah. Is that is that a real red light therapy light? Yeah, I just got a oh, red light therapy nice. light. How's that working for you? Are you like? Well, energized? I just got it today, so I don't know yet. I feel like it's like part placebo, part actual uh, therapy. 
in yeah. quotation marks. I, I mean, there's like a little evidence for it, right? I think they do use it sometimes in hospitals. Oh, yeah? Okay. I think so, no, potentially. Yeah. I mean, All right, I'll I, take it. You can't be on that. Yeah. I'll take it. I, I'll handle that. Yeah, so I'm going to be using it, hopefully, uh, the occasional break. From the desk and computer, I'm just going to stare into red lights and try not to go blind. But anyway, we're not here to talk about the latest and greatest biohacking. We are here because there were some things that were said on a thread in Slack, and that was almost six months ago. There's been some updates, but the best part about it is that we all decided to get on this call and hash it out between each other. So I appreciate you two coming on here. And I know, I guess it kind of started by Patrick, dare I say you said some outlandish stuff. Maybe we can kick it off there. And I know we were just talking about it right before we started. And you were like, oh yeah, now I remember this thread. I have strong feelings about this stuff. (laughs) So what's, where are the strong feelings coming from, man? Break it down for us. Yeah, I think Farhood, I posted that LLM Ops is more of just like a hype uh term for who see money i uh, i feel differently i think dell mops is like maybe almost a totally different field that is you know i mean there's some overlap with ml ops and what we traditionally did there but i think you know the majority of what i see kind of being used there is wildly different so we kind of got into it in the thread and uh yeah uh, and now we're on a podcast so then we will share that thread too but i almost and so I'm very undecided on the topic. I will say that right now. But Farod, where where are you coming from? What's your stance on things? Um, I actually think that LLM is like a very good thing. It's like the obvious. It's, it's very obvious that uh, it has like given opportunity to many people to uh, try new things, uh, provide new services, and all things that like that. But I think like Emma loves at the core of it is like a mindset. It's a mantra. So I I cannot think like of LLM LLM ops as like something completely new. Maybe another paradigm in the field, but I think like all these startups, all these people who are like talking about it, talking about it, and talking about it are like. Uh, blowing into a bubble. I've seen it t- too many times in like other fields. Uh, first it was cloud. Yeah, cloud it was great, but we we all remember the cloud hype. Like even Xbox wanted to uh, have games on cloud like in 2012. Uh, come on, we cannot do that. So <laughs> it, it, there's like this. Uh, we see optimism. I I'm all for like technical people providing stuff, doing stuff, like talking about their challenges. But I think like at these moments, the field gets hurt because some people are too opportunist. So at the end of the day, I'm pessimist about this stuff. It's kind of bubbles. Yeah. So it's like over-promising and under-delivering. Yeah, yeah. over-promising, under-delivering and hindering uh, actual technical people who are like working with uh, outlandish goals or uh, outlandish claims and things like that. It's, it's like I I get that uh, we have to talk about MLOps for LLMs. I get that, uh, and I get that that even the term MLOps is a bit like it's only trying to get its feet like really really recently. Like it's yeah. if if you talk with DevOps people, many of them like are so dismissive of the MLOps term. And even in companies, big, big companies, the, the term is not the same. Like what MLOps means in Microsoft, Google, Facebook does not like map to what a medium-sized company ha- wants or things like that. So the, the field is very young and uh, trying to like have these special, specializations and uh, not to look generally at problems we are trying to solve uh, is like uh, is like the gold rush. I, I think of it as a gold rush. LLM is the current goal, and we all know it. It, it provides so many possibilities, but 
NLM ops or things like that, even like see a, a, a new paradigm like prompt engineering. I'm pessimist about that. I know that it, people can do that, but I don't think like in five years time, we have something like prompt engineer. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I'm just ignorant and pessimist, but I'm a bit like um, uh, skeptic, uh, skeptic when I think about this. It does feel a little bit like prompt engineering is an artifact that hopefully will go away. And I do feel your pain on the LLM ops is already a branch of something that isn't exactly a branch of something else. It's like a branch of a branch that never existed. So where's the foundation there? Yeah. I could see that. I do feel like when you start to throw data into things, it gets a little bit more tricky. So L ML ops in my book, of course, I'm talking my book because otherwise, like what have what's the whole last three, four years of my life been built on, if not MLOps community. But I do feel like there is some definite, distinct differences between DevOps and MLOps. That doesn't necessarily mean in my eyes that you can't be a great DevOps engineer and then easily transition into being a great MLOps engineer. And so I feel like that is a really great way to make that transition. But I do... 100% hear you on two things that I want to mention. One is that the term MLOps means something completely different for a gigantic company, these FANG companies, the enterprises, versus a mid-sized company. And the needs that someone who is in that role, because now we're starting to see these MLOps engineering roles crop up, and the needs for the people that are in these roles it's wildly different depending on which company is asking you for that. So I will agree on that 100%. And, but the thing that I also want to agree on before we jump is the idea of LLM ops is now the hot buzzword of the moment. And so if you throw that onto your pitch or onto your whatever you're going to be talking about, it is easier received, I think, out yeah. there in the internet and space and all that fun stuff. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I don't doubt that there's hype and there's obviously hype. I think it's good for the ecosystem to have hype. We want to head a lot of directions and then, you know, eventually like find the pieces that work because this is entirely new technology. So... I don't disagree that there's hype and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of things being built that are completely useless and they're probably pulling people down paths that aren't good. But this is a totally new space we need to explore and find out. You know, from my perspective, I was an MLE of One Medical, you know, before my current role um, and, you know, doing a lot of ML ops, you know, you know, ML kind of 1.0 stuff, what I'd call, which was, you know, basic, you know, early NLP stuff, anomaly detection, you know a lot of like XG boost type stuff on, on tabular data. Um, and the skill set that I had there, which I feel like I got pretty good at, uh, you know, my next role, which has been founding a company, we were, we're building a generative AI space and I've, you know, worked with a bunch of founders of generative AI space. And I feel like that skill set that I learned at One Medical was almost just not at all applicable to LLM ops. I love that. Hold on, break that down for me real fast because the skill set that you were doing, what was your day in and day out at One Medical? And mm -hmm. what's your day in, day out now? I know that you're playing with agents now mainly, right? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, one medical, you know, is a lot of like setting up the standard like ML 1.0 tool stack, right? Running that stuff on Kubernetes, you have ML flow, you're, you know, training uh, NLP models, like the early transformer models on, you know, data using, you know, whatever library you wanted to use for training then, SageMaker training or whatnot, uh, then serving it on Selden or KServe or, you know, any of those setting up sort of evaluation tooling uh, for that stuff. Uh, we, you know, we we're building models, you know, one of my primary jobs there was sort of, you know, building models to, uh, you know, detect things in text uh, and, and classify it, just doing, you know, multi-class classification uh, of, of text. Um, and I just feel like that skill set moving from there, I went from there to, LL, you know, building on LLMs and building applications on LLMs. Uh, and working with a bunch of different founders or building applications and LLMs. And I just didn't see like 
there's hardly any crossover, right? It's like MLflow now has some like LLM capabilities in it. So a lot of these tools are like pivoting towards that direction. But just having kind of like lived that experience, I just, I didn't see like, oh, what I learned at One Medical, just not a lot of it applied. I mean, some of it as far as like how you evaluate things, you know, the, the basic understanding of like how a transformer works and stuff. But I wouldn't necessarily call that specifically like ML ops, maybe some of it, but so there's some bleed over. I just, I didn't see a lot of it. That's all. But you feel like that is because you don't have to worry about, like you're not serving the model, you're just hitting an API. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely part of that. But even if you're like doing fine tuning on a model and serving it, you know, it's, that's also totally different just because of the scale and like how you fine tune LLMs, you know, with Laura and whatnot. That's like a totally different tool set than what we're using with the, with the early transformers. So I also felt like that didn't translate over even, right? But, you know, the biggest use case with LLMs is definitely like, you know, a JavaScript developer with an open AI key, right? And that's, that's all they have. And now they're, they're building AI applications off that, which we never really had before, yeah. right? And there's, it's really, really hard to get an AI application on LLMs out to production. It's just, it's astoundingly challenging. And we don't really, we didn't have any tools at the time to really help with that. So I do think a lot of the tools being built in the like LLM, you know, LLM op space are actually really useful. It's just, there's been a lot of noise too. You got to like sit for it. So, uh, I guess my last question for this round, and Farhood, I, I want you to weigh in too, is don't you feel like the data pipelines and almost it's like the data engineering side of ML ops is the same thing still with LLM ops. I actually think they are almost identical because um, when you have data, like the prop, the the main problems that ML ops like is trying to solve, apart from like uh, the model pipeline, is like how you deliver the data transparently secure and like rep reproducible so this this doesn't change whether you're training a, a black box like an llm or like a very simple model like i don't know like svn so it doesn't change the the the, the mantra it's it's like the this paradigm we are enabling ml ops we are enabling the, the never-ending cycle from data to production. So it doesn't matter where we're like using LLM or using like a very simple model or even use like something like, uh, I don't know, human in the loop models. Like uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're trying to provide as much automation and as much security and transparency for like the companies to benefit from. So uh, I think that defines what MLOps means. Uh, it it adds another cycle to DevOps. That's that's because that, that means like way, when people uh, when DevOps people like try to um, simplify MLOps, they cannot like uh, ignore this added cycle. This added cycle is at its core is like the definition of MLOps, and it doesn't matter if. Uh, whatever tool you are uh, like you're defining above that so i think like after transformers something new comes in like i don't know maybe graph uh, maybe graph cns like uh maba yeah may, maybe they become like norm again i don't know and see the things like that the the problem remains the same like we're engineers well, we we are not uh, defined by our, our technological stack. I think, like I think LLM is like a technological stack. Like, uh, yeah, it's uh, very good. It's very challenging. It's a new challenge that we are trying to solve problems by LLM. We have never seen this before, but um, it's like let let me think from uh, a step. Uh, step behind and think about the future like what did we do uh when we first tried to solve the ml problem the simple ml problem okay how can we map that to LLM? uh i actually think that there is like this void that people are feeling uh for LLM. there's not there's not uh like a doubt about that i don't have a doubt about that 
But I think like we should extend our current tools and current tooling, not uh, like separate them into these like very small specific surgical tools because at the end of the day, this is not a, a scalable, I think, for me. I think for me, it just goes back to the user. Like, what's what's most appealing to the user? And I think with LLMs, we just we really have a different, like, user profile uh, overall. Like, there are some some similar user profiles, right? But now we have, like, this whole, whole like, new ecosystem that's opened up of, like, JavaScript developers, Rails developers, like, all these other people who are starting to use AI directly in their applications. So I do think we do need a new set of tools, like, cater specifically to those people who aren't necessarily like, um, you know, it's just not the same use cases we had prior. So, And that reminds me of a question that I wanted to ask you, Patrick, and that is really about how much of, like, how much are you going to benefit if you do understand MLOps when working with LLMs? Because it does feel like, I know you're, you said, look, it's totally different things. It warrants a new name. I can 100% see that. I do feel like on one hand, though, you're going to be able to accomplish what you want to the more that you understand ML, the more that you understand. And maybe it's not training a model. Right. Maybe it is training a model with the, like you were talking about with Laura's, I don't know. And that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out is how much of a power up is it going to give me if I like the more ML that I understand, the more ML ops that I understand, the more data engineering that I understand, the more DevOps that I understand all of these, like if I can take from that, because if it is generally a JavaScript developer or a Rails developer that is leveraging this, like where wouldn't you think they want to go deeper to be able to accomplish their vision? Yeah, I, I think it depends on what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're fine tuning Laura, like there's there's a bunch of overlap, right? I mean, I do still think we probably want specific tools, and that's what we've seen like pop up in the ecosystem. I think that's what's effective is having tools like specifically for Laura's because they do have a specific set of problems. Not that you couldn't work that into a larger tool. I think it's possible. But what I think we've seen emerge is that it's easier to use a tool like specifically designed for that. So yeah, I mean, if you're fine tuning an LLM, I, uh, you know, ML ops and you have a history in that, that's going to be incredibly beneficial, right? Even though just to understand the base concepts of what you're doing. But if you're a JavaScript or a Rails developer and your job is just to put out an application that people are going to be using, I don't think it's super helpful. Like, I think it's helpful, obviously, if you have that. I just, I, I you know, it's, it's a lot less so. Yeah, I just feel like how much value are you able to create if you're just doing it as a JavaScript developer, right? Like how... I think a ton of value, honestly. Yeah, because LLMs are still just a textual interface, right? And that's all we have. I think what we're starting to see with Gemini and one of the things we're definitely working on at Daros is like making LLMs be able to create UI elements, right? So you can actually start to create a web page and interact with because... A lot of times that's a much better experience, right? To have an actual web page than to just have text, which can get boring and, you know, it can be harder to navigate, right? So, but, you know, until we really have that stuff and that stuff working really well, I think having a JavaScript developer would be able to whip up an application that's really tailored towards, you know, a specific user uh, and have all the, you know, bells and whistles of, of an application. I think that's, you know, re incredibly valuable. And so it feels like you're you're kind of arguing for the long tail of use cases that people are finding and it doesn't matter the model under the hood per se. It's like, yeah, we can all have the same base model because my use case is such a sliver and it's so unique that the, the use case itself is the valuable piece, not the data that is powering the model. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely different theories on this, but yeah, I mean, if you look at like what YC is investing in right now, they're almost entirely investing in, you know, the the first thing you mentioned there, which is, you know, developers just going after a specific use case, applying LMs to that, working that into business workflows that already exist and selling that. And that's proven to already be quite lucrative, right? I think if you're going for the yeah. data play, there there are plays there. It's just, uh, it's it's challenging to train a model that's going to be on par with GPT-4. Right. And we can fine tune models in specific areas that can do that. But 
GPT-4 is just so far ahead that like you, you're probably going to have, you know, a hard time getting there and providing something as much value as just like, you know, context engineering uh, on top of GPT-4. Farood, I thought you might have something to say there. Yeah, I actually agree with that, that we like have to abstract a lot of layers. Like this is software engineering we're talking about. When we're talking about software engineering, we like we 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 like to have like reproducible and measurable building blocks. So when the the challenge, the main challenge of MLOps in our era at least is like oh uh, the we have like we have to be uh, build those building blocks for our companies. So we are like we are the abstraction, like that mean that I am the documentation. So like. Yeah, we are the abstraction here, and um, we provide that for others and uh, to benefit from. Like, so when we're talking about a random JavaScript or even a random Python hobbyist, like uh, trying to uh, write a buy, uh, write a bot or something like that, I I understand that. I actually believe that it's a miracle of like. Uh, engineering that what uh, people are like using chat GPT for th this and that like it, it, it takes a lot I, for, because of my MLOps background I understand how much of an effort was put into it so the abstraction is necessary yes it is necessary but do we need it in the LLM ops space or should we talk about okay these these are like this is the layer of MLOps and this is the layer above that for whatever AI we are providing like uh, what can we do can, what can we do to uh, separate these reliably have a blueprint for that because I I think like most of our us like traditional <laughs> MLOps engineers uh, we have uh, faced this challenge too many times and. There, there are still so many confusion about like how to actually solve this problem. That's uh, the I, I, I had this talk with my, one of my friends. Like I think that MLOps is not a single engineer. It should be a consistent of like five different engineers. That you have to be a data engineer. You have to be a data scientist. You have to be a DevOps engineer. You have to know about backend. You have to know about a bit like about, uh, I don't know, the, you know, BI is good. So at the end of the day, this is like, this This is branching in itself. This is a paradigm. So we are like uh, filling a void. The void will like become mature, like you, you see the blueprint. But uh, this type of like hyping things up, LLM ops, I don't know, maybe and not, in a few years, we see something else ops or yeah. something else. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we know the, how the, the tech world or tech bros work. We know that. Like web three ops, I can assure you it will happen. Web three ops, I can assure you. So I think that like we have to, uh, as engineers, as fellow technical people, we have to like uh, make it easier for future engineers for future problem solvers enable them to in, uh, to enjoy the fruits of our labor so this this like this uh, this type of uh, redefining the problem the problem that was partially solved by another group by another dude I don't know uh, it, it, it's it's like irks me a bit because uh, I think it's like uh, the dot-com bubble Everyone tried to have their own site. Yeah, many sites had like this uh, amazing service like Amazon, like, like Google or things like that. But not not all sites provide like this, this is speculation. I think that that irks me a bit. This is Skylar. I lead machine learning at Health Rhythms. If you want to stay on top of everything happening in MLOps, subscribe to this podcast now. Now, 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 now. <laughs>
I don't doubt that. I, I'm a big fan of bubbles. I think if you look at the research, bubbles, you know, uh, bubble-like economies, you know, uh, they perform better, right? So you have this big bubble, you explore a bunch of different areas, it pops, and then you kind of find out what's actually useful. But uh, if you were to just go up gradually without the bubble, you actually go up slower than if you go up with the bubble and kind of go down and up, right? So this is kind of a proven economic theory as well, right? So like even, you know, the dot-com bubble, yeah, we had a bunch of nonsense on that, but... By, you know, exploring isn't necessarily nonsense. People just going out, like trying things and doing different stuff and, you know, putting money into it. And I think particularly with AI, like we're underinvested still, I think. I think we're massively underinvested. I think we are, you know, with LMOps as well. Like we're talking about, you know, potentially like the evolution of human beings, right? Like, I don't think you can be like too invested in this space. And I don't think we can be trying too many things. Like this is this is the future of potentially everything, right? And I think like people are finally starting to see that and we're getting the VC money into it. And I think it's, I think these bubbles are great. I think they're fantastic. But that's, that's just my view of it. Ride the wave is what he Ride said. Ride the wave, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm all for calling bullshit on what it is. If, if it's a spade, it's a spade, right? And sure. I do feel like we need to, I like this idea of like, Hey, we should cut through the noise, make sure that the future generations understand that, yeah, there is some differences here, but here's the key points that you need to keep in mind. How much of that is going to serve you for this field, whether it's ML ops, whether it's DevOps, whether it's LLM ops, I, I really appreciate that. And like being a trusted source on just like this is way out of left field, but I'm going to give you a little antidote, all right? <laughs> if I were told when I was a wee little lad, really that not all drugs are created equal, maybe I would have been more receptive to believing what a drug does what, and I wouldn't have had to go and try for myself, right? And so... But it was a good time, right? It was a good time. Was. That's exactly. Really it was great. I'm glad I did it. But I wish and I think I'm going to, with my children, sit them down and say, look, you know, you've got your weeds, you've got your psychedelics, you've got all these different things. They're very different breeds of drugs, just like you've got your ML ops, you've got your LLM ops, you've got your dev ops. They're all very different breeds and there is some overlap. There's some similar feelings, we could say, but I am leaning towards they're not exactly the same considering the type of when it comes to llm ops the type of person that you are seeing that is leveraging the llm tooling that's out there i do see the profile that you're talking about patrick uh come up quite a bit and it's almost like the builders but that doesn't mean that it's only those people right yeah. it's like I do think there's a lot of crossover with the platform teams that can be called MLOps teams and they are leveraging L LLMs too. And they're used to working in a certain way. Maybe it's just the fact that they like Python. And so you have to keep that in mind too. Where's the bigger segment? I don't know. Probably, I think there's a whole lot more front end developers than there are ML engineers. That's the thing that that I'm definitely seeing too. When I, I've worked with a bunch of startup founders, it's like you know, there are people doing the lower level work, but there's just so many JavaScript engineers, there's so many Python engineers, there's so many application developers, and they're all using this stuff now. And it's just a huge segment of the market that's been brought into the ML space. I do think we need to like teach them some of the basics, and you know, there's a lot of people doing courses and whatnot to really like teach them what a transformer is and like you know how to do good ML stuff. And I do think that's probably useful to them, but. It's a totally different market. We're saying it, limits. It's like nothing we've seen before. Yeah, what's interesting to me is different tools that are building for these personas. And I know there are LLM tools that are coming out and they're saying, hey, we're just for the persona that loves TypeScript. And yeah. that is the tool that we are building. We're not trying to accommodate any Python or anything else for that matter. It's just that TypeScript developer if you are that person, then we're the tool for you. Yeah. Vercel AI. Yeah. There you go. Vercel AI is a perfect example of that. That is so true. The AI component of the Vercel. And so, all right, now let's play a little game. I like to call, uh, did he actually say that shit? 
And this is going back to the thread that we that kicked off this whole thing. And now let's see. Did <laughs> I'm, I'm looking right at you, Patrick, and we're going to say, did he actually say that shit? Because I have to question you about some things that were said on that. Here's here's what uh, we are wondering. Prediction. Gen AI will eat ML 1.0 in less than three years. Did he actually say that shit? 100%. 100%. There's already companies there. Unless Gen AI will eat. I'd maybe, maybe, probably sooner. Honestly, I'd probably say two years. Oh my God. Explain yourself. Explain because I cannot... <laughs> Handled it. I mean, it's, it's basically like hugging GPT, but you add like training into it, right? Uh, you know, we're getting good at teaching agents to use tools, right? We're getting better, better at doing this. And obviously, we're, we're starting to train foundational models to do this. There's been some come out recently. We're seeing a paper called Agent Tuning that shows that if you train specifically on, you know, types of tools, you can get much better. And you can actually, pro you know, approach GPT-4 capacity for using tools as well. So it's like, you know, if you think about a model and the ML ops, you know, 1.0 ecosystem as just a set of tools, then, you know, as soon as we get good at using tools, you know, ML 1.0 probably isn't needed for the most part. You know, agents should be able to run that whole stack. Obviously, this depends on foundation models getting better. Uh, but I think we've, we're seeing so much money in that space that I just can't imagine it doesn't happen. I mean, there's that's a big assumption there. Just because there's money in a space, shit's going to get better. I think yeah. that's probably the... There's a little bit of a delta yeah, in that. Yeah, that's not that's not direct, but we are seeing a, a rapid rate of progress. So if that continues, I think we get there. And if it doesn't, yeah, it's, right out. Right. It's definitely not going to be because of undercapitalization. Yes. That is for sure. Yeah. Because we just saw today or yesterday that Mistral got a massive second round, whatever it was, like three hundred and forty-five awesome. yeah. million, and awesome they work. released. They recently released another model too. And so that's great. Uh, I mean, Patrick, I, I actually want to get your pulse check on it. Are you primarily playing around with the big models that you mentioned your love affair with GPT-4? And you also mentioned how you were using Gemini. But have you tried to play around with these Mistral models or the Llamas and see is there a fine-tuned version that will be my specific one for using tools or creating agents yeah there, there's there's a number that have come out there's also like nexus i'm gonna forget the name of this nexus uh, nexus flow i think they just they just came out with a, a task model that shows that it had to be a flow yeah of, of course, course. Yeah. They, that's something that they're never gonna let go of from the <laughs> that's ML what we're going to ops ecosystem up yeah the flow exactly that's the only thing that's left after as you say it gen ai eats <laughs> <laughs> fucking the last ML 1.0 just the only thing that's left over is the flow artifact the flow yeah but yeah we're saying that i'm super bullish on on tuning these uh these open source models towards tasks uh, and it's one of the main things i'm focused on right now with my company on uh, just seeing how good we can get these models at you know performing specific tasks because that's you know i think as soon as we accomplish sort of tasks in code gen you know i mean we take the the model, and I think most people do, of, you know, executing tasks as a matter of generating code, you know, against specific APIs, uh, which is pretty common. But uh, I think once we master that, we're pretty close to AGI. I think that's, you begin to approximate AGI. It, it's Man, still, again, uh, he's throwing out words like AGI. Holy shit, <laughs> I don't even know. This is a first in this podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> we got to go You've, taken, you've <laughs> taken the red pill. You drank the Kool-Aid, man. Absolutely. Full on. Absolutely. Oh, I, I can't imagine. I still want to break down, like in your eyes, how does an agent effectively render ML 1.0 useless? Like, I still don't see that as clearly as you, and so I'm trying to like pick that apart. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know it's it's similar to probably what happens in the human brain, and this is I can go a little nuts here. Um. Which is that, you know, we have our neocortex, which is basically one algorithm that we know, and it's it's like one pattern, and it's this thick layer, you know, on the on the top front of our brains. And then we have all these other areas in our brains that do specific things like, you know, process visual data and process auditory data. Those are all different architectures, right? Like we developed convolutions basically from looking at how the brain processes visual information. That's how Jan LeCun came up with convolutions, right? 
I uh, and it, you know, I, I see it kind of evolving in that way where we're gonna have this higher level brain that can probably begin to construct like lower level algorithms that are really good at processing things like audio data and visual data, and they'll be better at processing tabular, right? It's like XG boost isn't gonna be replaced by LLMs probably anytime soon because it's so efficient and so small and so effective at what it does. But LLMs will definitely be able to train XG boost models on tabular data. We're already doing that today, basically. Right. And they start to be able to, like, with more autonomy, be able to handle that life cycle. So, as we see the autonomy of agents go up, which I think over the next year or two, we're going to see a huge jump in that because pretty much every research lab is focused on that right now. Uh, so, assuming they're, you know, they see fruits in their efforts, um, you know, we're going to see agents get a lot smarter. And then it's just applying agents that could do tasks to, you know, the job of training models. But I, there's so much other shit besides training the model right yeah yeah i mean i think you know the, like we talked about the data engineering side super hard and i you know some people consider that ml ops some people don't i'm kind of on the fence i do think it's kind of its own thing that exists outside of ml ops it's not that different for ml than it is for other things but um that part of it's probably gonna be the hardest part to automate but the, as far as like training models evaluating models serving models that i think you could do pretty easily with agents within two two three years well because it does feel like the data modeling is so context and you need the mm. experts there that a model, even if it can do it, does it understand everything? Like it just feels like yeah. a very hard problem. I'm not saying it's super, a super hard problem on the data engineering side. Yeah. Super hard. And it's all streaming. A lot of times it's at high volume. Yeah. You know, things can go wrong that are super complicated down the pipeline. Like that gets really hard for sure. Yeah. So ML 1.0 gets eaten. And I did hear, so when I was in the Berlin ML Ops community meetup last week, one of the guys there was talking about, hey, we're always talking about generative AI for this generative AI for that or ML ops for generative AI, AKA whatever foundational model ops or LLM ops. And he's like, what about generative AI for ML ops? Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, I think that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. The Abacus AI is kind of doing this. There's a couple of companies that are starting to, to try to do this. I don't know how well it works yet, but people are like approaching that space. I think that, um, the, like what the foundation models and things like that are solving is very admirable. But for me, the, the main challenge is like in the whole ML scene is, uh, the way transformers and all these architectures are like, uh, working the carbon footprint and the energy consumption of them is like very high and becomes higher and higher. And the main problem I see, the main obstacle that we have to solve eventually is like how to make these models an actual building blocks. So right now, if OpenAI like wants to train a new GPT model, it has to, it has to train from, I don't know, like from scratch, I think. So, uh, when, when we were talking about it, the cost of this is like, it will add up and add up and this is not engineering. This is brute force. Uh, we are currently, we are like uh, creating uh, enough value to justify that. But as time goes by, these simple problems that LLM is solving and hopefully complex, more complex uh, problems, um, these these will like, we have to like uh, have solve this trade-off. How much is enough? And how can we like go past from that? So this is the main challenge from, uh, from my point of view. It tied, it's tied with like many of the global issues. So um, I know that many of the jobs or many of the uh, things that these automations are like uh, trying to get rid of are, are actually those, those have the, their cat, carbon footprint too. But in the end, uh, we have to think very seriously about it. Yeah, that's all right. There's a company out of MIT right now that, that just got a bunch of funding that's solely focused on, yeah, how do we make these things environmentally friendly? And I think it's a huge problem. Yeah. If we want to use them at scale and use them the way you're saying, it's just building blocks put into everything. 
uh, yeah, we need to make it more efficient. And luckily, like that Mamba paper that just came out, you know, is wildly more efficient than the transformer. It has, you know, linear uh, context scaling, which is incredible. Uh, so we have yet to see if that can scale the same way Transformers can, but if it can, it's super promising. I mean, it's punching 2x above its weight right now. So Yeah, I think the the interesting piece, we had Jonathan on here like a week ago from uh, Mosaic ML, and he was talking about how his lab tries to reproduce pretty much any paper that comes out. And up until now, it's been dismal at best because of how they don't hold up once you get to a certain what he was saying the industry needs and the yeah. standards yeah. that you're expecting at the industry level and so it's great he was super kind when it came to praising the researchers that are trying to push the envelope but he did say like, yeah, I'm not going out on Twitter and putting anyone on blast, but I am going to just caveat all these papers. Be aware when you're reading them, it is very hard to actually see that being used at scale that we are used to. That's an innate problem with ML in general, because like when we are MLOps engineers, we're like, at this forefront of like two different paradigms fighting, we have like research minded people who are like try to uh, absorb as much resources as they want. Like they they are trying to get that knowledge. They they want to know more. The research mindset is is about that. Give me as much as you can, so I can think for one more second. And the engineer mindset is like I have to like be resourceful. I have limited resources and I want a feasible solution. So MLOps in general is like you're standing there and you're trying to appease both of these uh, people. Both of, like this is the, this is the main uh, problem with ML. Like it it is what what is like being published in papers is being instantly tried in the industry. So. Like we don't have this nag. It's it's very interesting in a sense. Like we are in in a very interesting. We're living in a very interesting time. Something that might be looked upon like a hundred years about it, uh, AI and ML. But in general, it makes it super challenging for like um, providing uh, stable and uh, thoughtful growth. So many things seemed like accidental a little bit. Like, yeah, this thing happened along the way and we did that and yeah, we're successful now. Many of the AI companies in Iran at least are like that. Uh, so who knows? So I feel like we should put a disclaimer right now. You know how they say like non-financial advice all, this whole conversation is not engineering advice or not career advice, I guess. Uh, listen at your own risk. Put any of this stuff into practice. And it's been a blast talking to you guys. I really appreciate this. For everyone that wants to see the thread that kicked off this whole conversation, you can check the link below in the description. And I think that's it, fellas. That's the pod. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Hey everyone, my name is Aparna, founder of Arise, and the best way to stay up to date with MLOps is by subscribing to this podcast.